You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 23. Welcome back, I'm Gavin Weber and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, this week is an interview with a, a gentleman who's, a, who's very close to my heart, it's actually my father, uh, John Weber. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Dad. Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> Righto, so the topic we're going to talk about today is life on a dairy farm. And uh, I grew up on a dairy farm and Dad worked on one for... It's about ten years, I think. So we're gonna we're gonna just uh, do a little bit of um, uh, Dad's earlier life, and then we'll get into dairy farming. Um, and this was on a really small scale, so we're gonna talk about that. And it was oh, I won't talk about dates. I'll let Dad do all the talking anyway. Um, Dad, over to you. Introduce yourself, mate. I'm uh, John Weber. I was born in 1941. My father was an engine driver in the South Australian Railways, and my mother was a housewife, uh, and uh, we lived at Tail and Bend for 14 years, which is was a big railway uh, terminal, and uh, after that uh, we moved up to Loxton in South Australia. So ha- how many brothers and sisters you got? I got one brother and four sisters. Gee, that's a, that's a big family, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I have lots of aunties and uncles. <laughs> yeah. So you lived in Tail and Bend for 14 years, and then... When what was one of your first jobs? So you joined the railways early on in life, didn't you? Yeah, I joined the railways at Loxton. One of my first jobs when I was still at the Taylor Men was in school holidays and weekends to work for a uh, fruit and veggie uh, uh, dealer that uh, used to pedal a three wheeler cycle around and deliver doing home deliveries. Oh, okay. That was my first job. So like the mobile greengrocer. The mobile greengrocer. <laughs> you come and place your order, and then I'd deliver it. Oh, fabulous! So the, a lot of that's coming back these days. The, um, the the three wheel wheel delivery things around the cities anyway in a city so it's good to see it's all coming back so um, well I was obviously born um, in um, in the early sixties but you moved you just made a decision to leave the railways and what what was that for uh, because at that stage the uh, Australian National Railways was taking over the South Australian Railways and there there was going to be a lot of job retrenchment so I, after ten years. I got my long service leave and uh, I was given the opportunity to uh, to share farm a dairy farm. Okay. And what year was that in? 1967. Well, that'll make me three years old. And uh, I had a, um, well, not had, I still have, a, a brother, Jim. Um, g'day, Jim, calling out to you if you're listening. Um, so he was one and I was three. So where did you, where did you start share farming? What was the place and, and size of the place? Uh, it was at. Loxton North, uh, the first dairy farm was only a small one. It was only about 100 acres, and uh, it was all irrigation, uh, a lot of hard work, but we got through it. Did that for, uh, I think, about three or four years. I'm not quite sure exact time. Yeah. Then I had the opportunity to go to a bigger dairy farm owned by the same owner. So how, how many head of cattle was on that small one? Uh, about 50 or 60 ca- um, milking cows. Yeah, yeah. So there was no other livestock? or No, no other, no other livestock. Yeah. I remember growing up there. It was uh, it was quite a nice little place, but yeah. Um, but I do have the the most memories of, of growing up on this larger dairy farm, which was only how many kilometres away from the smaller. Oh, one? probably only uh, one and a half kilo- kilometres by yeah. the crow flies. Yeah. So how many acres was that? Was that? That was about four hundred acres all told. Two hundred acres of irrigation and two hundred acres of uh, dry land. Oh, okay. So how big was the the herd of cows? Milking uh, cows. We, we probably milked about 120, 150 cows, and, then, and uh, there's probably 30, 40 dry cows at any one given time because we milked all year round. Yeah. So what I understand the dry cow concept was. Well, uh, with the cow, you you uh, once they've had a calf, uh, you let them uh, go for three months and you mate them, and then uh, uh, you usually give them six to eight weeks to, uh, uh, dr- you know, dry put them out dry yeah, yeah. so they can build up uh, body weight and uh, and their calf. And once they've had a calf, you just start the cycle again. Oh, okay. All right. So And you did that with a um, about a quarter of the herd, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So that kept the milk supply going all year round, yeah? Yes, because we're 
we've paid for whole milk, premium milk. Uh, so uh, the more you could produce in winter time, the, uh, the more money you made. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so um, let me have a chat. So you mentioned that we had um, there was two hundred acres of of dry land. So what did you farm on that bit uh, of land? On dry land, well, uh, we used to have three main paddocks. Um, We'd crop rotate every year, but it was mainly oats for yeah. for uh, uh, once you had the you know, early rains in March, April, uh, you put oats in, and uh, once I got to a certain height, you then graze the cows on it because uh, the pastures in the winter time in the Riverland of South Australia um, it was frost, of course, and never grew, so you had to find some other supplementary way of feeding them mm. besides silage and hay and chaff, etc., cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera. So, what sort of how how much rainfall did that does that area get? You know, how many inches? I was trying to think. With, with the Riverlands, only about eight to ten inches of rain, something a year. That's, so that's all. incredible. So that's right on the fringe yeah. of of dry land farming. I know yeah. a lot of wheat comes from around that area as well, and that's all dry land. It's not irrigated, is it? No, no, that's the Mallee area, which is next door to the Riverland anyway. Yeah. Um, the, the ten years I was on the dairy farm, we had three droughts. So it gives you some idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. So, the, so we got the water. So for the other two hundred acres, it was. Um, it was water from the Murray. And how did the water get distributed through the dairy and stuff? Um, probably uh, 60 or 70% was flood irrigating with the pastures and the rest, which was loosened, uh, was all spray irrigated with spray lines. Oh, okay. So the loosen was then turned into hay for the cat- cattle in the, um, uh, what, the off-season? I don't know, what's that? Yeah, yeah, mainly. Um, we used to produce about seven or 8,000 bales of hay a year that was loosen, and we used to under-sow the loosen every year with oats so that you had a combination. The first cut we used to do, we make silage out of it in the pits. Yep. And then after that, uh, we used to uh, bale it for hay. Oh, okay. I remember that was one of my favourite playing areas was in the haystack itself. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a 1,000 cats, I think, too. They just bred like rabbits. One stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what was the, the daily routine sort of thing? So what time would you get up in the morning? Half past three, four o'clock. Oh, my God. Um, summer or winter. Yep. Daylight saving or not, because we used to go by the clock, not by the sun. Uh, partner would go and, or my wife at the time, would go and uh, um, get the dairy ready. Uh, I'd be going down with the dog and getting the cows out of the pasture. Yep. And then uh, we'd milk till about, oh, I don't know, seven o'clock, I think, something like, like that, and then uh, clean up and put the cows out in the pasture for the day and then come back and have breakfast about 8 o'clock. Oh, okay. And then what, you do your chores after that? Yeah, just... the farm maintenance, uh, produce uh, chaff, uh, crushed grain, uh, and any repairs to any farm machinery or in, in the summertime when you're irrigating, mm. changing the irrigation from one paddock to another. And then in the afternoon at 3 o'clock or half past 2, you go down and get the cows Three o'clock, you start milking, and you'll be finished by five. Yeah, but then you have uh, you have a nap in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, we had the nana nap. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's when uh, <laughs> and that's when um, uh, me and Jim used to get up to so much mischief. I think because yeah, you guys were asleep and we were out mucking around on the farm. No comment on that. Destroying things. <laughs> <laughs> Many a time we had a uh, smack bottom for breaking farm <laughs> machinery that Dad had probably just fixed the day before. <laughs> So, yeah. all right, so we've got the, the routine weighed off. So what about, um, you know, when the animals got sick and stuff, what sort of veterinary, uh, veterinary service did you have there? Oh, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, uh, the person we used, the main person we used, we used to use two vets. Uh, one was more a backyard vet for general uh, cow sickness and uh, any uh, major problems with cow. We used to have a, a qualified vet and... Uh, uh, but we never had, uh, because of the dry, dry climate, we never had uh, uh, much sickness in uh, with our c- uh, cattle. Oh, okay, yeah. So because um, it, it wasn't really, it's not a wet place. No, I, no, I remember no. being dry as a bone all the time, except yeah. for the irrigated paddocks. That's right, yes. Yeah, so that's incredible. So that, so a couple of vets. Um, so what did the, the qualified vet do? What was that for, like well, breech births and yeah, troubled he, yeah. the cows were having and stuff like that? Yeah, he was mainly involved with... Uh, uh, especially uh, young heifers, uh, sometimes they'd have uh, trouble calving and uh, the calf would have to be taken, same as a, a, a woman, a cesarean, and yeah. uh, uh, that was his uh, his uh, forte, I suppose that you would. Yeah. And the other vet was mainly for uh, the cows were a bit sick, uh, you know, he'd mix up a concoction of... 
uh, chemical <laughs> or um, you know, like uh, vitamins, that type of thing. Yeah. And uh, you feed it by mouth, and uh, next minute the cow's okay. So he, he was like the um, the homeopath uh, yeah. vet, and the other one was the, yeah. the qualified That's surgeon right. type thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, you, you don't have to use chemicals all the time. No, no. That's for sure. Um, and that's great. So, all right, let's start talking about the milk. So, you know, you've got, what, what did you say, 150 cows? Yes, yes. All right, and, but only 110, no, sorry, 120 are on the milk. Something about that. Roughly, yeah, yeah. 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 So how long did it take to milk them? I used a couple of hours, hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. And then ha- how did the milk get treated? So it come, obviously, <laughs> take talk us through how you get the milk out of the udders, all the way to whatever we stored it in. Right over, uh, because we had a milking machine, a milking machine, of course. Uh, when I first uh, did the dairy, we used to have a, uh, the milk used to run over a, a cooler, uh, which was chilled by uh, cold water. Yeah. In, into 10 gallon um, milk pails, I suppose that's what you call them. So that uh, stainless steel. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, and uh, they were stored under in this uh, big cabinet underneath this big tank of cold water. And then uh, later on, uh, we converted to bulk with a big bulk tank. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, the milk used to go straight in oh, uh, once it was uh, went through sieves and that type of thing, make sure there's no uh, nothing untowards in it. Went into the then that tank was refrigerated, and the moment you started milking, uh, that automatically came on, and uh, away you went. Oh, okay. So the and then how how often did the the milk get picked up every, from the factory? Uh, every two days. Okay, so it'd sit in the vat for for two days. days. And what sort of what sort of butter fat was, content was the milk? Uh, the butter fat we used to do herd testing uh, till it got uh, too expensive. I think our average was about three point nine to four percent because we had a mixture of Jerseys, Frisians, and uh, Ashire cows. Okay, so Frisians are are called Holstein. Oh, is yeah. that what they? Yeah, very yeah. similar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They give the bulk milk, and uh, the Jersey cow give the butter butter fat. And so the creaminess, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I notice it's always better to make cheese with um, Jersey milk because you get a far more quantity of milk yeah, and of, we, of cheese. Yeah, and we were uh, in them days paid uh, by the volume of the milk and the butter fat content. Oh, okay. Which nowadays they get they pay different nowadays. Of course. Yeah. So it was chilled and then shipped to a factory. What factory and where did it? Get shipped to? Well, the factory was about uh, 30 kilometres away. Uh, the bolt truck used to pull up at the door, hook the pipe up to the tank, and, and well, you measure it first to make sure what your volume was, yeah. take a sample, and uh, we go to a place called Remark to a private uh, milk processor called Fallon Milks. Yep. And then uh, he would uh, pr- pasteurise it and uh, you know, into the bottles at that early stage, and then yeah. later on, be bottles and cartons, and uh, he'd make his cream and you know, flavour milk, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So was that just, it was just pasteurisation? At that stage, in them days it was, yes. So it wasn't homogenised? No. No. Okay. But you also had um, bulk milk sales. It was legal back then to do bulk milk sales from the dairy door, wasn't it? That's right. And we, yeah, it, it was it then. And also we, the local milk distributor, locks the milk distributors, uh, um, he used to uh, sell bottled milk as well as bulk milk from our dairy. Oh, okay. Um, but then, of course, like everywhere else, uh, um, it wasn't allowed. And, of course, we still used to sell to, at the door to private people, but not to, not to a distributor. Not to the pub, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. And I actually remember that um, all we drank was raw milk. We, did, we didn't buy it back from the, the processor at all. We drank it straight off the uh, – out of the – either the 10-litre um, – um, oh, sorry, not ten like ten gallon cans, or yeah. or you, we'd have a billy, a little. For for those non Australians, a billy is like a little metal bucket, take home with, with, a, with a lid, and we take yeah. it home after the milking was finished, and we just you know use the milk for just about everything. And I remember at one stage, Dad, you had a, a separator which could separate the cream from uh, the, the the fat content out of the milk. But ha- did you do that often, or did you? No, no any time we did that, mainly was. Uh because we were on a quota to, to the factory, we were paid a certain price for the quota. Anything over, it would cut the price cut in about half. So what I used to do was separate uh, the surplus milk and um, keep the cream for ourselves and also sell to the public. Yeah. And the skim milk, I used to have a couple of pigs uh, and uh, used to feed to the pigs. Uh, but, but, but that's only probably for about uh, two months of the year. And then after that, we're back to the quota level and where we went. Yeah. Yeah, so the and I remember eating 
a, a fair bit of pork. Yeah, <laughs> we, you'd, you'd, when you when you slaughtered the pigs, we'd keep one and you we'd freeze. I don't know, we'd freeze both of them. Yeah, um, but they were big fat pigs. And, and yeah, and also we used to run uh, in the irrigation channels, which are earthen channels. We used to run. Uh, I used to go to the sales and buy old uh, uh, ewes or weathers and. Uh, you know, real skinny, bring them home, shear them and put them in the irrigation channels to keep the grass down. Yeah. And once they fatten, fat, you fatten them up, because I used to have a mate that used to be a butcher, used to slaughter for me, and uh, you know, that meat was just like having lamb because because it was, you know, grass-fed fast. And yeah. It, it was good. Yeah. So it wasn't like your old um, uh, stringy mutton. No, no, not the old hogget or something like that. Yeah. Oh, lovely. And I do remember eating, remember eating lots of beef, lamb, pork, Chooks. Ch- chickens, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right, we'll, we'll, I'll just get back on the subject of milk again. So, um, so what, what's your opinion on raw milk? I don't think it never hurt any of us, uh, our generations, and uh, same with you kids. Uh, um, you know, there was no, I can't see any side effects. If the, if you, you did the right thing, you know, with cleanliness, cleanliness in a dairy, you had no trouble. Yeah, so you ran a pretty clean ship, yeah. For the 10 years that I supplied the factory, we, we were classified as choice milk. Never once did we fail below that. That's fantastic. Good effort, Father. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What? So you only spent, I remember you, just before I joined the Navy at 16, that you left, made a decision to leave the dairy. Um, so what was that all about? Well, after 10 years, uh, having about one week's holiday a year, uh you couldn't sort of go anywhere because uh, in the River- Riverland area, we never had any relief milkers like you do down uh, um, Murray Bridge or in the Lower Mar- Murray area. And it was hard to find someone that would actually look after the cows for you for a week. So uh, uh, I made a decision. And of course, you c- kids uh, weren't interested in uh, carrying on daring. Mm. Uh, so uh, I decided to get out of it. Yeah. And and then I took on five jobs after that. Yeah, to, keep, to make ends <laughs> meet. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. So what happened, you mentioned to me um, before the show that um, you think that was a really good decision because something happened to the dairy three years later. Yes, um, that's when restrictions came in on the use of water from the Murray River because of droughts, etc. Uh, and uh, the person who ended up uh, buying the dairy farm from the, the owner, uh, uh, he transferred the uh, water licence to, uh, uh, to uh, a fruit-growing property and also they... Uh, rehabilitated the irrigation system, which used to supply us with water, and therefore there was no overflow water, which we used to get well, most of it anyway, uh, at no cost to us. Yeah. Um, uh, that became extinct. It wasn't there. Yeah. Because he had to pipe, he had to enclose everything, didn't he, for that, irrigation? They did, because everything's now pressure irrigated, a pressure supplied to the, all the uh, fruit growers in the river land, mm. or in Loxton anyway, where before it used to be open channels and some pipeline. Yeah. And that's for two reasons. That's uh, for, to decrease salinity as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And also, uh, uh, no, with pipelines, of course, there's no wastage with the uh, uh, moving water around. Yeah, evaporation the, for yeah, the channels, yeah. Yeah, yeah with the... Channels, of course, there's always leakage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know. Yeah, yeah. That, a lot of things have changed in the Riverland since since I was a kid. That's for sure. So, are there any dairy farms in um, around that area anymore? No, not, no. They've all uh, all closed down, probably for the same reason that when I was on, and also the milk factory uh, Fallons at Remark uh, closed down because he never had enough supply of milk. Yeah. And now it's become a milk depot for some uh, milk company. I think I believe from Victoria. Oh, okay. So are there um, any um, dairies in South Australia supplying milk to South Australia? Yeah, still down in the um, um, Murray area, like around Murray Bridge, Jervois, Wellington, uh, all, all through that area. Yeah. Because they've got uh, lower costs with far as water supply, et cetera. Yeah, they get it, more it, rainfall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and even then uh, they they struggled. Uh, they, their water allocation, I suppose, the quota was cut back the same – Time as uh, the dairy lies on Loxton uh, North, and mm-hmm. uh, um, they, a lot of them blokes have struggled as well. Yeah, so that they've got what one factory at Murray, Murray Bridge. Bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Victorian, because um, I know Victoria supplies a lot of milk for for Australia, um, not a lot, not just South Australia, because of the water issues that they had over there. Anyway, so let's talk about chickens. <laughs> Seeing they're one of my favourite animals. How many chooks do we have on the dairy? 
Oh, I'm trying to think now. It used to have about 20 or 30. Jeez. Uh, yeah. There's no restrictions, obviously, because no. it's a farm. <laughs> yeah, and, and used to have our own grain, so I used to crush the grain and uh, supply it that way. Um, the chooks I used to buy, there used to be a poultry farm at Loxton uh, after, was it two seasons? Yeah. Um, they used to take them to the local market and uh, used to get, buy them fairly cheap from the markets. You used to buy a dozen at a time, something like that, and then bring them home. Uh, I did get caught the first time I did it because these chooks used to have their beaks trimmed. Oh, de-beaked, yeah. And, of course, yeah. I used to throw the grain on the ground. and They couldn't pick I, it up. I lost some chooks. So then I found out the idea is to put it in a container, then they'll eat the stuff. Oh, so were they, they were ex-battery hens, yeah? Yeah, ex-battery hens. Yeah. Uh, all, all, and at the stage, they're all white like horn. Oh, all right, yeah. Yeah. So, but then did you get? Um, so did you keep getting the? You had no choice. You couldn't get non de beaked. No, no, no. But they no. weren't iso brown. I remember them being white. Yeah, yeah. That's so. White, yeah, white so they're white. white. So like the two leg horns I've got. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah feisty little buggers. Yeah. Um, I do remember chasing chickens around a lot, and that was always because they would always get out. There was always one escapee or two or three. Um, and usually that escapee ended up on the dinner table. Yeah. <laughs> well, because yeah. really, um. As far as um, meat goes, chicken was a luxury, really, wasn't? Because you're there for the eggs. You didn't. That, that's right. You don't that, particularly yeah. want the. Um, um, you didn't want the meat from the chicken because we had all the other, like you said, we had the lamb and we had the um, the pigs the and pork the pork and the and the and the beef. Yeah. Um, but yeah, chicken was a luxury, which is which is amazing because now they've factoritized, if that's the word, in uh, industrialized the chicken process and. And chickens are the cheapest meat now, instead of the uh, the other way around. Well, that's right. And we went. Each, we only used to have it on special occasions. There was one time that also I bought a, I don't know, a dozen turkey turkey chicks. Yeah, yeah. And brought them home, and uh, I uh, we killed them. Off. I think the best one ever was a fourteen pound dressed turkey. That's how big the buggers were. So that's like. Uh, seven kilos. Seven, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> big birds. That's a big, big turkey. And the main reason I got most of, rid of most of them in the end because they used to fly over the top of the chook yard. Oh, okay. Because it wasn't at, um, <laughs> there was no post. mesh over the top. Yeah, no. It's a bit like mine. But, um, yeah. And I remember ducks too. We yeah. had a few ducks in we the chook house next. Yes. Yeah. Was that just for the eggs or? Yeah. I, I don't remember eating any. Uh, I think that. Uh, used to use them in cooking, I remember, Rolly. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then same thing, uh, special occasions. For baking, know, yeah, yeah. You baked a duck and away you went. Yeah. So I think mum used them for cakes and the yeah. eggs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. money cooking. Oh, that's cool. All right, Dad, it's been great having you on the show. Um, thanks very much for imparting all your wonderful dairy knowledge. I, I could talk for ages, I dare say, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll keep it at, at this. I've run out of questions anyway. But um, anything else you want to um, leave to anybody? Because there's, there's a big... I wouldn't say it's a craze. I say anybody with a little bit of acreage now seems to be getting a a house cow. Yes. All right. Anything? Um, any tips on um, on on maintaining your house cow? Make sure that the animal's well fed and uh, mate it from time to time. You, you don't usually have run a bull. You get someone that does AI and uh, uh, you'll have a continued supply of milk all the time. AI artificial insemination. Uh, yes. Yeah. Because we used to, we did that the last two or three years on the dairy farm. Um, we still had two stock bulls, a Hereford and a Frisian, mm. but uh, the local vet, cause any um, calves we had uh, that, uh, right, if they are heifers and that come from a good cow, we used to keep them for, you know. Just keep the stock going, keep yeah. Keep the stock going, but if it was a bull calf, um, we used to take them to market. But then the local vet came and saw us and uh, he wanted, uh, he had acreage and he wanted to have cemental, uh, cemental, yeah. Uh, the so, grey coloured, yeah, the big, yeah, so it's like um, big char- Charolais cows. Yeah, so they're uh, beef cattle. Yeah, they're beef cattle, aren't yeah. they? And they were, they were massive calves when they're born. So uh, and used to supp- supply the uh, uh, semen and uh, uh, and he'd buy the calves from us at a certain price. Oh, okay. Sounds like a good deal if you can get it. Well, it was for him anyway. Yeah, yeah. So not so much for you. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, uh, once the calf was born, we got we got to just you know, feed it and keep it going. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and once it uh, was weaned off its uh, mother, uh, he came and took them and, and, and uh, fed them uh, yeah. you know, artificial milk, of course. Yeah. Well, not artificial, but powder milk. Powder anyway. milk, yeah, yeah. And went from there. All right, fantastic. All right, thanks, Dad, once again. Um, lovely to chat to you, and it's always great to have you. Well, it's the first time you've ever been on the show. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to do it via Skype next time. I'm sure I've got some <laughs> questions about urban farming when you've seen you did it on the massive scale. Hey. All right, thanks, Dad. Thanks again for having me, Gavin. No problems, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 
Well, I think you'll agree that was a great interview with my dad and you learn a little bit about dairy farming in the 1970s. Uh, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, there's been industrial scale production of, of uh, dairy farming and uh, and things have changed. So for upcoming workshop dates and cheese making videos, you can pop over to littlegreencheese.com. You can also find on that website my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of Little Green Cheese. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows.